All right, good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started this morning. Let's all stand and turn to page eight. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We will sing first, second, and fourth. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Second verse. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord church good, good to see you guys here beautiful sunday morning in june can you believe that already right, the month of june this year is clicking right along a couple things about announcements we get started today this week starts vacation bible school though this year we'll just have a three-day vacation bible school starting wednesday and going through friday wednesday thursday friday each evening 5 30 for meal and then of course uh, six to eight for, vac for vacation bible school teaching so mark your calendars Okay, so it could go. Be prepared that it may go to 8:30. Gotcha. And if it goes later than that, you'll just have a lock-in with them. And yeah, I guess I'll just bring them home. All right. <laughs> but keep that in mind. Vacation Bible School. If you can't, if you can't make it to help, at least be in prayer. Just stop what you're doing this week around you know 5:30, 6 o'clock, and just say a little prayer for the kids that are here. Uh, if you'd like to pass out some flyers, I know I gave you some earlier. We changed the dates. You can. Put the new flyers out on top of the old ones, pass them to neighbors and friends. If a child would like to come but doesn't have a ride, that should not stop him or her from coming. We'll make sure they get here one way or another. We'll make sure they get picked up for vacation Bible school. If they live reasonably close, within, you know, within Hopkins County or close, close enough. But so we would love to have a child uh, come regardless of uh, their ability to get themselves here or not. Also, this morning have Lord's Supper after the morning service. So if you'd like to participate with that, I ask you to stick around. Uh, Brother David and Jeremy will be, will be serving here in a little bit af right after the ser morning service. If you, for some reason, object to uh, participating, that's understandable. We'll have an intermission between the end of the service and the Lord's Supper service, so you'll be able to leave at that time if you choose to do so. But all the uh, elements are prepackaged. We did this once before, about three months ago, so uh, all of the... The juice and the wafer is all self-contained. Nobody's touched this except the factory it came out of, wherever it was 30 years ago. <laughs> it does keep. <laughs> but it's, it's, been, it's been kept in storage, so it's, it's all good. That should not be a factory. You'll select, you touch just what you want, and open it up and serve yourself at, the, at your pew as we did the last time. Now let's see here. That's two most pressing announcements coming up in a couple of weeks, of course. It'll be Father's Day. We'll have regular service and recognize fathers on Father's Day. And I believe that starts the official summer. So that'll be coming up here in a couple of weeks. Can you guys think of any other announcements you should be aware of? Anything else we should know? 
Okay. If there's nothing else, let's now move to prayer concerns, if we can do that. A couple of prayer concerns. Um, my brother Scott Leet had a heart attack, or one or two heart attacks this past week. Had quite a few heart issues this week, and uh, finally got his pacemaker put in Friday. So just keep my brother Scott in prayer. He is, what, 60? Born in 54, you do the math. Be turning 67 this year, right? Thank you. Because he's a year older than my mom. So or 65, that's right. So keep him in prayer um, and pray that he gets, he's back home now and on the men, so keep him in prayer as so he recovers from that also. Um, what other prayer concerns do we have here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Pray for your travels to and from Georgia, did you say? No, right? Alabama. Alabama, I'm sorry. Oh, Alabama. So pray for Gina and her family to travel to Alabama this coming week. Any other pressing prayer concerns? Just yes. uh, keep praying for James Wynn. He's in uh, rehab for two weeks after his back surgery. All right. And then pray for Jewel. Gotcha. Yeah, I spoke to Jewel on the phone just briefly last week, and she said that she went in with some heart issues, and they kept her. She said almost against her will. She didn't want to stay, but she stayed a couple of days. If I remember right, a pacemaker issue, she may have said. Uh, something, a machine picked up her uh, odd, some kind of oddity with her pacemaker, so she was feeling sluggish, she said, from that. And that having heart issues can make you feel very tired, and she thought that's why she was f feeling more tired than normal. And, of course, her son, uh, James, had the back operation. Did he have some tumors or something cut off of his spine or some discs or spurs or something? That's it. Okay. okay. Well, we will certainly pray for James. Okay. Paul Rose, R-O-S-E, Rose. We can pray for Paul. I also pray for Danny Gibson. My, my father's cousin passed away, Danny Gibson. Brother Jerry, I would uh, ask you to pray for my family. My, my grandmother passed away this morning. Give me her name if you don't mind. Naomi Oglesby. That's my mom's mother. Okay. Just remember us and pray. And keep us in your prayers. Absolutely. That's right. The death of a saint is much harder on the loved ones who stay than the saint who leaves, that's for sure. So we'll keep your family, the Oglesby family, in prayer. And understand your due date's been moved to August, is that correct, Miss Cecily? August, we were, we were off on our calculations. Okay. Did the different pregnancy math and came out with an August. Yes. August. Okay. We actually asked the uh, doctor, and that's what they said. Okay. Okay. They usually schedule you ahead of time. We'll pray for a healthy delivery. It's a hot time of the year to have a baby, but it's not not worrying about snow and ice on the roads and it gets late to the end of that thing. <laughs> so we will keep you in prayer as your pregnancy comes to an end. The baby gets here soon. Any other pressing prayer concerns? Brother Jackie? An unspoken. Any other prayer concerns? Anything else? Are they doing meal deliveries for Hopkins County this year? I'm not sure right now. I okay. have seen a one day where you pick it up on one day and they give you for more, uh, breakfast and lunch. They're like okay. little packs. And they may be doing that. A feed uh, program. I know the buses aren't right now because the buses are doing uh, summer school. Yeah, you, I'm pretty sure you have to okay. pick it up yourself. I will yeah. say that. 
see. I think I Jerry said he's agreeing with you, Michelle. There's a summer pickup for there food. There's a summer pickup. I believe it's uh, one day a week, and they give you like a pack. For a week. For a week. They give you for a week. Yeah. And you get okay. breakfast and lunch for a week. Right. Okay. And they have, it's like you can pick it up at North and several of the schools around here. Seven different, seven different schools. Okay. I'm going to try to see. I have it on my page. I was going to try to look it up real quick. <laughs> Any other announcements we get started this morning? Any prayer concerns we get going? If there are none, I ask you guys to please stand with me at this time. We're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Remind you guys of the prayer concerns mentioned this morning. I pray for Sister Jewel. Did has been feeling sluggish and tired, but we do know it's related somehow to her, her heart, so keep her in prayer. I also pray for my brother Scott, who had a pacemaker installed this week, uh, is doing better after his heart attack. Keep him in prayer. Jan has a cold. Keep her in prayer as well. Shirley Griffin, your cousin, keep her in prayer. I uh, had some deaths recently, the Rose family, the Gibsons, and the Oglesby, so keep those families in prayer with loss. I uh, also pray for two unspoken requests. Uh, pray for James Wendt, recently had a tumor taken off of his spine. And then lastly, pray for Gina and her families who are traveling to Alabama this coming week, so keep them in prayer. Anything else we get started this morning? Okay. There we go. We can do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeremy, close us up. Oh, just open us up in prayer. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to be in your house, Lord. We just pray that you prepare our hearts, Lord. Help us to. Uh, just uh, receive your word as Brother Jerry preaches, Lord. I pray that you help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. I pray for these requests, uh, all of all that are mentioned. You know each need. Uh, even before we mention them, Lord, you know. But uh, you, I pray that you just receive our, our petitions, Lord. Answer them according to your will, Lord. I pray that you forgive us of our sins. I pray you be with the bereaved and the sick and and all those just needing prayer. God, I just pray that you uh, go with us and, and just let your name be glorified today. And everything that's said and done, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I did forget to mention Billy and Judy still under the weather. I spoke to Billy yesterday or texted him back and forth. So fatigued and still kind of tired, so keep them in prayer as well. Sorry about that, David. I meant to mention him. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, we have the kit. Let's see here. Birthdays. See, I need to get to my bulletin. Birthdays. Miss Glenda is out today. She's got a birthday coming up. We'll catch Miss Glenda Trapunic when she comes back. And I told you, Jerry, would catch you and your wife. When your wife comes back to church, we'll sing happy anniversary to you guys. Okay. It might be August where she gets back, but we'll, <laughs> we'll sing happy anniversary when she comes back. <laughs> any other birthdays, anniversaries coming up this week? I didn't see any in the church calendar, but I could have missed it. Any early June birthdays or anniversaries? That's right. We'll get you guys next week. If I think that's right. right. We will get you guys here soon. Anybody else here first week of August? June. June. I said August a minute ago. See, Jerry got me. All right. There's nothing else. Um, let's see here. We're going to take an offering up, but wait after the children's sermon, take the offering up. We're going to start that again. And so we'll have the guys come and take up the offering today after the children's sermon. So kiddos, come on down for the children's sermon. Uh, Brother Jerry, could I use you this morning? 
Did you come down? Yes. Wow. Uh, careful here. The Israelites and the Philistines was they was enemies. The Philistines was an evil people. These people, they worked with iron. They had great warfare. They had iron swords. They had iron shields. And uh, some of them were pretty big people. And the Israelites, they was terrified of the Philistines. Because they was, you know, the Philistines was big people. Cameron, I'm going to use you this morning. Sure. Could you stand right here beside Brother Jerry? Uh Nobody, none of the Israelites wanted to fight against the Philistines because their mighty warrior's name was Goliath. He stood over nine foot tall. He stood out there in the battlefield and he hollered and screamed and mocked the Israelites, made fun of them, daring them to come over and fight him. And uh, there's a little boy, uh, the, I think the Bible uses the word a ruddy boy, which we use Cameron this morning. Look at him, just a small lad, young man, you know, just a child playing, and uh, he stepped up and he said he would fight the Philistine, the giant. And I use Jerry because he's one of the bigger men here. He's trying to show a comparison. Uh, but uh, David, he could he couldn't hold up the sword. He couldn't hold up none of the other stuff. So the Bible says David went to a brook and picked up five smooth stones. So here, you can hold on these stones if you want. But there was only one giant out there in the field. So David picked up the five smooth stones. The giant hollered at David and told him, said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed your body to the wild beasts, to the birds of the air, the animals of the land. And all the Israelites were scared. Because this giant, man, he was huge. Look at Jerry and look at the size of Cameron. <laughs> well, well, David, he walked out there against the field, out there where the giant was at. He kind of ran out there. He picked up his slingshot, pulled a rock out of his bag, slung it, and what happened? Oh, you want to reenact this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 So he took it, he slung it, and he, when he let that <laughs> sling go, what happened to that rock? Oh, it hit the giant, right? You, Between the eyes. You think you could hit Jerry this morning? You slam it through three times? Man, man, slow. When the rock hit him, the giant went <coughs> face first to the ground. And David run out with this, run out to the giant. He grabbed the giant's sword, cut his head off. And then the Philistines took off running, and the Israelites chased them. But that's how, uh, that made Made me think of that battle was because of D-Day today. And that was another great battle. And I hope you kids remember about David and Goliath. And size doesn't matter. If God's on your size, victory is always right around the corner. Amen. 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 Good job. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. So Jerry was a bad guy? Well, Jerry, yeah, Jerry's a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have any questions? But why do you think David picked up five smooth stones instead of just one? He knew that God was on the side. Does anybody know? You think Goliath may have had some brothers? Oh. Four brothers? Yep. He had a stone for each brother. All right. You guys want to stand? What's that prayer for him? Do you have anything you want to pray? A prayer request? Um, my brother. My, my father's half brother. Okay. Hello, Pastor. Okay. We're about to head and close eyes. Father in heaven, we love you and praise you today, Lord. We thank you for the children that come to church today, Lord. Uh, Lord, with the prayer request that the children's mentioned, we ask you to look into their heart and give them comfort and peace about it, Lord. And we lift them up to you. We ask you to be with the children, help them grow. And Lord, we ask you to be with this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
This time we ask the men to come forward to collect the offering. Brother Jackie, lead us in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again today. And then, Heavenly Father, we're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, dear Heavenly Father. And then, Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the preacher and bring the message today, dear Heavenly Father. And then bless everyone here today, dear Heavenly Father. And the one that couldn't make it today, dear Heavenly Father, we don't know the reason, but you do. But touch them in some way to do your will, dear Heavenly Father. And we collect this offering for you, dear Heavenly Father. And, and Father, this church, dear Heavenly Father, bless the church again, dear Heavenly Father. Ask for the precious Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. <laughs> I did I found that information if anyone needs it for about the meal programs um, they do summer meal program during June and July it will be from 10 30 a.m. till 12 30 p.m. every Wednesday at let's see here West Hopkins Great Vine Elementary Mattisville North Hopkins and Earlington Elementary and if you need any for any more information or you know anybody that does, feel free to ask me and I can give you all the information that I have, okay? Moving on then. Let's turn to page 221. We'll sing all three verses.
I'm going to ask Carr to come up here and help me on this next song. Come on. Uh-uh. Come on. She's gonna help. She's gonna help me. She loves to sing, and I want you guys to help as well. So please stand and join with us. We're gonna sing "Reckless Love."
Let us pray. Our Father, we bow before you this time. It's the words of that song still echo in our hearts and minds. That, Father, in the salvation relationship we have with you, you were the pursuer. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Father, again and again, your, your word says there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that does good. There's none that seeks after you. And just in the parable, the shepherd who leaves the 99 in the fold safely goes to find the one stray sheep. Well, that's a picture of my salvation, if there ever was one. A wandering, confused, timid, frightened sheep on the verge of his own disaster is rescued from the perils of death by the Good Shepherd. Father, remind us that you are the pursuer, the great hound of heaven, the Lamb of God, who gave himself for us that we could be saved. Father, as we transition now from the worship of you through song to worship of you through your word, we ask that you would be with us this morning. Let us rightly handle these texts. Put pride and ego aside. Father, all that we do now will be done to glorify you. Be it the person today who is here who struggles with doubt and despair and depression, feelings of failure, insecurity, anxieties. But Father, more importantly, be it the person today who is here who does not know you as Savior, that your Holy Spirit would move among us and convict us of sin where we sit before you. Draw the sinner to heaven. Courage and comfort the saint. For it is in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. If your Bibles are at hand, I ask that you would turn to the Gospel of Mark this morning. We'll be at Mark most of the morning, and then I'll finish up in, I think, Philippians 2, way toward the end. So when you hear me get to Philippians 2, it's time to kind of wake up, put your shoes back on, and uh, get ready to walk out the door. It will be time, because that's toward the very end of this thing. Let me ask a couple of questions as we get started this morning. Of course, the title is, Who Sits and Who Serves? But before we get to that, let me ask two questions. What mouse walks on two feet? Mickey Mouse, very good. You got that one right, Jeremy. How about this one? Uh, what duck walks on two feet? All ducks. Thanks for stealing the punchline, Cameron. I was gonna say He's going to say Donald Duck, but the punchline is all ducks, of course. Oh, so Cameron, if you know the punchline, please don't steal them. How about that? How about this one? You ever see teenage girls sitting out somewhere in parks or uh, beaches or places wherever they gather? I asked the question, why do teenage girls sit in odd-numbered groups? Because they can't even. That uh, <laughs> was bad. And then the last one, and I promise you, if you're finding Mark 10, this would be it. Uh, a teenager at a funeral asks the priest for the Wi-Fi password at the funeral home. And the priest is shocked. Right? Have the audacity to ask for the Wi-Fi password at a funeral service. And he says to the boy, have you no respect for the dead? And the boy says, is it uppercase or lowercase? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's bad, isn't it? Who sits and who serves? Survey, survey 100 high schoolers or young adults who have yet to start a career and ask them what they want to do in life. Now, some might say medicine. Some might say, I want to be a scientist. Sure. Others might say, I'm going to go into the performing arts. Or some might even say athletics. I want to be a star quarterback on the New York Jets or whatever the case might be. But it's unlikely if you survey 100 young adults, ask them what they want to do in life as a job, it's unlikely they're going to pick a job where the pay is low, the status is low, and the job is very difficult. Yet every job and every economy for every age through all of history has had jobs like that. Little boys don't dream of pouring asphalt in 100 degree days, do they? Little boys don't dream of working in limestone quarries. Little girls probably don't dream of picking fruit in an orchard somewhere for the rest of their life or working with patients in nursing homes who are terminally ill. 
but those jobs are needed. You know, if you boil down any economy, there's just two types of jobs in every, every economy. There are jobs in the service industry, jobs where you serve people, maybe in medicine, maybe you have a service where you cut someone's grass, you provide a service for them, you walk dogs. And there's another type of job in any industry where you produce goods. Either you're, you are a service industry worker or you a produce goods. Maybe you make uh, lawn mowers or car tires or maybe plastic toys, but you maybe either produce something or you provide a service. But to, I say all that to say this, today we're going to look at a, uh, the career choice of two of Jesus' disciples who angled toward a position of authority in his coming kingdom. They asked for something, they sought for something they had no right to ask for. So let me set the stage, the context of this. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, we're going to be in the very final week of his ministry here. As he was nearing Jerusalem, there was this electricity all around Jesus. The crowds were buzzing all about him. There was the, the scuttlebutt at the water cooler saying that he's the next Messiah. Now the Messiah is a word that means something different to us than it meant for them in that day. In the day of Jesus' culture, the word Messiah... Uh, comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed one. One who was anointed typically to rule or to reign. You know, in Jesus' day, it was expected that when the Messiah came, he would come through the line of David, he would sit on the throne and usurp authority and reign from the throne in Jerusalem. In fact, if you don't believe this, look at Jesus' triumphal entry in Mark 11. So kind of hold your thumb there, turn to Mark 11, look at 9 and 10. I want to show you from the text how they expected the anointed one, the Messiah who would come from the line of David. Mark 11, 9 through 10. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting. Here's what they're shouting. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. They expected, rightly so, that when the Messiah came, he'd be coming through the line of David to reign in Jerusalem. And they were right to expect that. The Bible predicted that. But let me say this. The messianic fervor had never been higher and the misunderstanding of Jesus' ministry had never been greater. Christ did not come to be served. He came to serve. He did not come to destroy. He came to die. He did not come to conquer. He came to be crucified. It was a widely held belief in Jesus' day that when the Messiah, when he would appear, would never do three things. He would never suffer, submit, or surrender. Yet Christ does all three things. A Messiah unlike we were looking for, but a Messiah like God had planned. In fact, Christ will show by example how we as we, his followers, must also suffer, submit, and surrender. Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 40 right now. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. I think that's how we pray sometimes. God, I'm going to twist your arm a little bit. you got to do whatever I ask in Jesus' name. <laughs> and he said to them, what do you mean to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drank or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said, and they said this in verse 39, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. The two sons of thunder come to Christ asking for a favor. Do whatever we ask of you, ask of you Jesus. Now, I like Matthew's version about this because he gives a detail that Mark does not for some reason. Matthew tells us that these two boys are almost dragged to Christ by their earlobes by their mother. And I'll show you this account. At least that's how it reads to me. Matthew 20 and then 20 through 21. Then the mother 
of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something, and he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say to these two sons of mine to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. If you ever wondered why there are the sons of thunder, I think we see it as their mama as their mama's thunder. The daddy might have been lightning, but their mama was a thunder. Now, in Matthew's account, these two men almost seem like unwilling participants in this request of Christ. But I'll tell you this, that's not the case at all. Because Mark lets us know, while their mother was with them, why well, does not mention that details? Because it seems to be also their idea. It's likely she's there to provide maybe emotional manipulation. When the question is asked, and here she's asking it, it's like she's trying to twist Christ's arm a little bit. I mean, who can say no to a dear mother? In fact, it's clear from the Gospels how much Christ loved his own earthly mother, how much he loved Mary. It is, in fact, one of the last seven sayings of Christ on the cross is, John, behold your mother, take care of her. In his dying words, Christ looks at the foot of the cross, sees the only disciple still standing there, and says, John, take care of my mother. But at this point in Jesus' ministry, even though he's told these guys three times that he's going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and be buried and would raise on the third day, they still expect him not to be killed, but to sit upon the throne in Jerusalem. These two men come to Christ with a blank check or asking for a blank check. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask for. Now Christ doesn't say, well, sure thing, buds. I'll do whatever you ask in Jesus name, in my name, right? He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, well, it depends, right? What do you want to ask for? They said uh, almost sheepishly, well, <clears throat> grant us, both of us, one of us, to sit on the right and the other to sit on the left in your coming kingdom. That seems like a small thing to ask for, Jesus. In your coming glory, would you let one, one of us, me or James, sit on the other side, either side of you? And just, we would appreciate if you let us sit in positions of power in your coming kingdom. Now, let me stop for a second here and say this. Glory for Jesus meant the cross. Glory for Jesus meant the cross. But glory for James and John on that side of the cross meant something entirely different. They wanted cabinet positions in the coming administration. They wanted seats of power beside Jesus himself. And Jesus said these words, you don't know what you're asking for. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, be baptized with the baptism with, with, with which I am baptized? Now, the cup that Christ refers to here is the cup of suffering he would drink from, and he would drink it to the very dregs. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ prays that God would remove from him that cup of suffering if there were any way. Three times Christ prays that and three times the answer must came from heaven from the Father himself. Not that he would remove the cup of suffering, but that he would give Christ the strength to endure it. There's no way to redeem sinful men except by the way of the cross. The father did not make a way of escape for his son, but gave him the strength to endure it. And the Bible says the angels came and encouraged him as he stood to his feet. But these two young, bright-eyed, wide-eyed, naivete disciples come and say, Yes, Jesus, we're able. They were biting off more than they could chew. And sometimes you and I ask for God for more than we know. Sometimes we rush headlong into a bad decision and our will overruns our wisdom. And Jesus said to the two disciples, the cup that I drink, you'll drink. The baptism which I'm baptized, you'll be baptized. He's talking about his suffering to these two disciples who have no idea what his kingdom on earth means to those who belong to his kingdom. He said, oh, Yo, you'll, you'll get it in spades. They would get the ridicule without the reward. They'd, they would receive a wage worthy of anybody that follows Christ. That's the wage of suffering. Indeed, they would suffer. 
And their reward would not be on this side of eternity, but in heaven alone. They would not be sitting upon thrones upon the earth, but in Christ's kingdom in heaven. Now, let me point an observation here. I noticed this years ago, I was reading this, when I, when I came across this account, and I began to, it really kind of jumped out at me when I first realized this. It is not a little ironic that the two men who asked to sit on thrones would die as bookends in the apostolic era. James dying first in 44 AD at the death, by the death, uh, from, by, the, by, the, uh, by the call of Herod Antipas. And then John the last disciple to die in maybe 64, 68 during the reign of Nero. They became the bookend martyrs of the apostolic age. Grant us to sit on one end or the other of you, Christ. And these men received that cross, that baptism of suffering. And they would reign with Christ and are reigning with Christ even today. Now, before we go any further, let me stop and ask before we get back to the narrative here. How would you expect the other ten disciples to respond? How would you expect their reaction to be to these two disciples coming and asking for this position of political power? Just probably how you would react and how I would react. Look in verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. That means they're very upset. Verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This discussion came up two or three times in Christ's ministry. Jesus, when we get to Jerusalem and you're, you're revealed as the Messiah, the anointed one, you take your position of power on the throne. Who's going to be in charge? Who's the next person in command? How are you going to pick your cabinet members? This discussion occurs once more, but one last time. You know how Christ settles debate, the debate? He has him sit at the table. He takes the towel, ties it around his waist, and begins to wash their feet. They never again ask who was going to be greatest in Christ's kingdom because the greatest was washing their feet the night of his betrayal. And that night, he washed 24 feet. 24 feet, 22 would run away that night. All but John would leave him. John would say to the very end, Christ washed the feet of the man who sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Christ washed the feet of the man who denied him three times in the garden. Christ washed the feet of the man who betrayed him and left him and ran off in the darkness. Christ washed the feet of those who left him to die. The Son of Man came not to serve, but to but not to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. Christ pulled these disciples aside to let them know his kingdom was going to be different. They would not be encouraged to selfish ambition, but to selfless service. He would serve as the greatest human example of humility in humanity has ever seen. Nobody in history has ever humbled themselves lower than Christ humbled himself. Now, if you don't believe that, take the Apostle Paul's word for this, who wrote, and here we're at the end, Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Paul says, in speaking of humility, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death of a death on a cross." From the highest point of exaltation as God himself to the lowest points of debasement, Christ became flesh. 
The God who flung the stars in the sky got cold in winter. The God who made everything on earth got hungry when his blood sugar got low. He got tired at night. And you think, I can't imagine God stooping lower. But wait, as Billy Mays says, there's more. This same God who was incarnate didn't just live the human experience. The Bible says that he was wrongly accused, falsely convicted. His beard was plucked out, crown of thorns placed upon his head, beaten, whipped, scourged, the flesh hung off of his back, carried a heavy cross beam right up the hill to Golgotha as far as he could take it, was nailed to cross beams. And if that's not bad enough, and it's bad, it got even worse. Because at the point of his lowest point of his all of his human existence, God the Father put upon him the sins of mankind so much that it seemed as though God had forsaken him. And that's the lowest point of debasement a man, a, the God man could have experienced. That the Bible says he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. When Christ prays in Gethsemane, to the point where his blood, beca sweat becomes like drops of blood. He says, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup of suffering pass from me. And three times the Father says, there ain't no other way, son, but I'll give you the strength to endure. Jesus came to give his life a ransom for many. Survey any hundred high schoolers or young adults. Ask them what career they'd like to pursue. Not a single one will say martyrdom. And now I ask my previous question, it is this, who sits and who serves? And the answer depends on which kingdom you belong. Let us pray.